Good afternoon again. Please take your seats. We're trying to stay on time here. Um, so I'd like to uh, get started as soon as possible. Good afternoon. I'm Mal uh, Malu Harrison, uh, and I'd like to welcome you back to this session at Miami Book Fair uh, 2017. Uh, if you were here this morning and you know Miami Book Fair very well, you know that the Book Fair is presented by Miami-Dade College and thousands and thousands of volunteers, among whom are students, faculty, staff, administrators, and many, many, many individuals from the community and from the corporate sector as well. In fact, our corporate sponsor, the main corporate sponsor is OHL this year, and we're very, very grateful to OHL for its sponsorship and its support. We're also grateful, as I've mentioned in previous sessions, to the circle of friends of Miami Book Fair. And I know that you're here in abundance this year as you have been in past years since 1984 when our book fair began, and we'd like to extend a special thank you to our circle of friends. And so without further ado, I'd like to call uh, Mr. Jono Mainelli to the podium. Please help me welcome him from the Lillian Fine Endowment Foundation. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jono Manelli. On behalf of my aunt, Dr. Ellen Fine, and her sister, my mother, Jill Manelli, I would like to welcome you to the book fair event sponsored by the Lillian Fine Memorial Endowment. I have the double pleasure of introducing the endowment and then Mr. Saunders as well. Professor Lillian Fine was my grandmother. The intent of the endowment is to offer a presentation on a work of literary quality. It is a goal to enhance the love of literature as befitted her love of books and her calling as a teacher. My grandmother treasured books. She came to the Miami Book Fair every year since its founding and often volunteered to work here. Some of her background, briefly, in the 1930s, she came to New York City to get her MA in education from Columbia Teachers College with my grandfather, Dr. Benjamin Fine, former education editor of the New York Times, and their four daughters. They moved to Rockville Center then down to Key Biscayne in 1971. She was born in Milford, Massachusetts, a tough young wife of a farmer. She had a practical, earthy side, one reason I know she would treasure Mr. Saunders' novel. <laughs> through Lincoln's experiences and through Willie's and through the graveyard characters, Mr. Saunders tasks us with deciding not just whether suffering, grief, regret, crippling regret, or even where, well, warfare are good or bad, but whether these things are practical, are they purposeful? Do they serve us? Will we take action? Roger Bevins III instructs us, all we can do is what we should. Saunders gives us the additional gift of visiting with Lincoln, a president upon whose shoulders these moral questions could truly rest, reminding us of what it looks like when a president could serve as the moral compass of a nation. My grandmother would have loved this book, Mr. Saunders. I'm sure her ghost does. Even more, she would have loved teaching it. Thank you on her behalf. Mr. George Saunders is the author of nine books, including 10th of December, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and won the inaugural Folio Prize for Best Work of Fiction in English and the Story Prize, Best Short Story Collection. He has received MacArthur and Guggenheim Fellowships, the Penn Malamud Prize for Excellence in the Short Story, and was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In 2013, he was named one of the world's 100 most influential people by Time Magazine. He teaches in the creative writing program at Syracuse University. His latest novel, Lincoln in the Bardo from Random House, is the winner of the 2017 Man Booker Prize. From a seed, yes. From a seed of historical truth, George Saunders spins an unforgettable story of familial love and loss that breaks free of its realistic historical framework 
into a supernatural realm both hilarious and terrifying. Please help me welcome to the stage Mr. George Saunders. Hi, thank you so much for being here. I, I, just before I came here, I called my wife and she said, where are you reading? And I said, at Miami Dade College. She said, oh, I went there. <laughs> Even after 30 years, you can be surprised. But, but she often tells a story. She was a dancer in New York City and uh, had sort of finished high school in a kind of a regular way, uh, made her way here. And this is where her intellectual life really opened up. And, um, Happy to say her, her first novel is coming out with Random House in August, so she sends your, her, her greetings to Miami-Dade. Um, th this a book was my first novel, but actually it was my first published novel. There's, uh, yeah, <laughs> there, there was uh, many years ago, my, my wife and I met at Syracuse, we were students there, and in that romantic Syracuse ambiance, uh, <laughs> we got engaged in three weeks, uh, got married uh, seven or eight months later, pregnant on the honeymoon, and then she uh, had a, a, a trouble with the pregnancy and had to go to bed for, the, for five months of their pregnancy, and then this happened with our second daughter as well. So by the time we had known each other two years, we had kind of morphed from these groovy beatniks to kind of like trembling, uh, aspiring suburbanites <laughs> who were failing. Um, so in this period, you know, we were really broke, and I was working as a tech writer, and um, during this time, uh, a friend of mine got married in Mexico, and we scraped the money together, and I went down for the wedding. And it was every young writer's dream. It was uh, in this beautiful part of Mexico on the coast. The, uh, the priest was a radical Catholic priest from Chicago. Uh, there was a male, uh, male model slash surfer in the wedding party, which is, you know. So I came back, and to my eternal shame, I actually said this to my wife. I said, honey, don't worry. You're sitting on a gold mine. <laughs> yeah, that was going to be my big novel. So... I worked on it pretty much for a year straight. I would go to my job during the day and at night come home and drink this uh, magical writer's combination of a pot of coffee and half a bottle of Boone's Farm. If you, yeah, you so, so happy to know people still know that brand. Um, and then I would just stay up and I would work late into the night and I told myself, this is how you do it. This is how you break out from this life into a, a, a better life. Uh, so at the end of that period, I had this novel, and just to let you, you know, in on its literary merits, the title was La Boda de Eduardo. <laughs> it was like Ed's wedding, you know. So, um, but it was 700 pages. <laughs> yes, uh, and I, but, but because I was at that time very much a Raymond Carver fan, still am. I thought I've got to cut this down, cut it down to 300 dense pages, uh, and then I said to my wife. Uh, I think you'd be very pleased with the results, but if you wouldn't mind reading it, you know, just at your leisure, you know. So she took it into the next room, and of course, like any real writer, I perched nervously outside the door, and honestly, she must have been in about paragraph four, and I looked in, and she was sitting like this. <laughs> so, and you know, if you're a writer, you know that sometimes someone will make a criticism like that, and you, all of a sudden you go, yes, of course, that's crap. I didn't know that. The book is so, I was so tired when I wrote it. There's no, no verbs, you know, very, very, <laughs> very minimal, very minimal. So anyway, the point of this was that really scared me off the idea of a novel because we both knew how much that had cost our family for me to do that for a year. So I started writing short stories and um, had some success with that. But right about this, so that was, that was my first novel, uh, which I still have in my basement in uh, Syracuse if, if uh, anybody wants to see it. <laughs> Um, but so about the same time, though, we were down in D.C. with our, our daughters, who were maybe two, two and three or four at that age at that time. And um, we, we were driving by Oak Hill Cemetery uh, in Georgetown. And my wife's cousin pointed to, up the hill to a crypt that was up there. And she said, did you know that that's where Lincoln's uh, beloved son, Willie, was buried back in the Civil War? I, had, I didn't even know that, that he'd had a son or that the son had died. Then she said, uh, and you know... Uh, the newspapers at the time wrote that Lincoln had actually gone into the crypt on several occasions to somehow interact with the body. Some accounts said he actually held the body. So this stunned me, you know, and I thought, oh, God, that, is a, that would be a great book. And then I th thought the word novel and got cold shivers. But, you know, honestly, it, it, that, there are, um, 
I had a, a writing teacher who said once that if a young writer could know the difference between the book she thinks she should write and the book she should actually write, she could save herself about 30 years, you know. <laughs> So I had a little instinct that that was not a book I was capable of taking on at that point. And actually, I was right. If you know my early work, it's pretty funny, uh, fast, kind of sci-fi, a little edgy. And at that point, I just didn't see any intersection between the, t the set of things I could do and things this book would require. So I kind of just backed off. And um, then, you know, many years went by. And every time that I would get into this place of artistic happiness, like if I sold a story to the New Yorker or something went well, that book would sort of come out of the shadows like, <laughs> oh, get thee behind me. Um, and finally, in about 2012, uh, I had sold a book called 10th of December, a book of stories. It looked like it was gonna do pretty well, and I just had this kind of midlife talk with myself, and I thought, you know what, this, this Lincoln idea, has been bothering you for 20 years now. I, tr I tried it as a play for a while. I tried it as a, a third person fictive uh, narrative one time, didn't work. But even so, it, it wouldn't go away. And so I thought, well, why, why am I so afraid of this? And the answers were sort of like this. It's too hard. It's got too much potential to be a disaster. It's too potentially beautiful. It's about all the things that you actually think about every day, you know, your love for your family, the, you're approaching death, all those things. Um, and after a while, th this voice was making a pretty good case that I should be writing it, not that I shouldn't. And I had this kind of vision of myself, you know, my, my own grave. And on the grave it said, you know, failed to do that which he most, most wanted to. I mean, that's not, not so good. So um, I decided to, to give it a try. And, um, you know, if, I'm sure there are a lot of writers in the audience. And what you know is that the... Um, a book always starts off in your mind easily accomplishable. I'll just type it up, you know. Uh, but that book sucks, actually. The book that's in your head that you know, you know every facet of it, if you just type that one up, it's a disappointment. Now, why is this? I have a little, a little trio of mantras that I like to talk to about this. One is by the great Donald Barthemay, and he says in an essay called Not Knowing, uh, the writer is that person who, embarking on her task, has no idea what to do. The second one, which I hope, are there any kids here? You, oh yeah, well you're a little, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll clean it up just for you, sir. I'm gonna, uh, Gerald Stern said, uh, if you start out to write a poem about two dogs making love, <laughs> and you write a poem about two dogs making love, then you wrote a poem about two dogs making love. Think about it, <laughs> but, but not too much. <laughs> and then Einstein, Einstein, always the smarty pants, uh, did the elevated version. He said this very profound thing that applies, I think, to science, but certainly to art. Uh, no worthy problem is ever solved in the plane of its original conception. So what this means is if you have a great idea about X and you march into your book very confidently and write that book, everyone's bummed out including you, including your reader. So what you're hoping is that the book will confound you. The way it does that, in my experience, is through obvious obstructions, uh, through inability to proceed past a certain point. Uh, in this case, the very first obstruction came very early. It was, okay, I'm doing it. I'm writing my Lincoln book. And again, if you're a writer, you know that at that point, something, for me, it's located here behind my head. Something goes in search of a voice. What's the voice I want to use? Well, the first choice, the obvious choice is, well, I'll do it, first person, Lincoln. Because he's the only one, actually, the only living person in the story, really. There's two other perfectly, but I didn't know that at that point. So Lincoln, oh, yeah, yeah. And instantly, that little voice goes, four score and seven minutes ago, I did enter yon graveyard. And, yeah. <sighs> so that didn't, some writers could do it, but I'm not good enough, so I, that's not good. Then you think, okay, wait a minute, now who else, who can narrate this thing? It's a guy alone in a graveyard late at night. You're like, mm, a grave digger? Practicing? <laughs> he, he, you know, well, look at that, that's a good one. I'll have to do that again tomorrow. That's a, uh, so anyway, that didn't work. And at that moment, what happened, and here it gets a little tricky. Uh, I don't want to go on too long about this. I want to take some questions, but... Often when we're called upon to explain our books, uh, we have to simplify. The, the form of the questions that a writer gets are a lot like the, the 
the way we thought about writing when we were in school. What's the theme? What was the author's intention? <laughs> Why is the color red such a prevalent motif? <laughs> These are good questions from the critical standpoint, but from the creative standpoint, uh, my experience has been that they don't really hunt. They, that's not really the way you, you think of, of your book. Um, so let me try to be honest about the way the solution to this formal problem came, and it's a, uh, a little complicated, but basically, I've had the experience on stories of mine where I had some sort of breakthrough. In retrospect, there were always three or four or five parallel m movements going on at once in my subconscious or in my something that then at the moment in question would cross in some weird way. Now in this case, there, I can tell you a few things. One is, during that period of 20 years of not writing this book, I wrote another graveyard book, believe it or not, uh, that was set in an upstate New York graveyard. And the only thing good about that book was that I had sort of stolen um, a format from, uh, from AOL Messenger. <laughs> and in the early days, I thought it was so beautiful the way that people would get on there and crosstalk. You know, you've got a name, you know, Starboy962, and then some ungrammatical, weirdly punctuated, you know, misspelling laden text. And at the end, somebody goes to respond to him, and then suddenly they would start breaking up. You know, they're, they're not really even talking to each other anymore. I thought that was very beautiful and very much what like we do in real life. Um, so I had written a book about, maybe I got 200 pages into this, of this graveyard book. It didn't go anywhere. There was no forward driver. But at the moment of the Lincoln book, I remembered that. And I thought, ooh, what if the ghosts were just monologuing uh, with attributions? That could be kind of fun. So that was one thing. Then I have a, a, a former student of mine, Adam Levin, who out of nowhere wrote me a text and he said, you know, I think if you ever wrote a novel, it would be like this story of yours. And the story was called uh, Four Institutional Monologues. He said, I think a novel of all monologues, that's what you would do. And then I had that most coveted artistic feeling was sort of a little bliss, like, ooh. You know, like when someone says, would you like some ice cream with chocolate? You go, yeah. It, that's the kind of feeling I sometimes get. Maybe not quite that pronounced, but something like that. And I thought, yeah, I, I, I could do that. And at that time, I was just reading uh, Infinite Jest for the first time, David Foster Wallace. And I noticed that when you really take that book apart, it actually is a series of monologues. And he gets everything he needs to have done accomplished just with people speaking very passionately from their own uh, experience. Then um, about that time, I also uh, was talking to my editor at The New Yorker, Deborah Treisman, and I told her about this comical, terrible Lincoln play that I've been working on for 10 years. And because I'm working class, when I write a play, I write a play. <laughs> and when I write a poem, I write a poem. Uh, so that play was really not, not good. And I mentioned it to her, and she just said, why don't you do it in fiction? Now, I had, of course, I had thought of this before, but Deborah and I have such a close relationship, and I trust her so much that when she said that, just something went open in my mind. I thought, if she, if she thinks there's a way this could be done, there must be. So I'll, I'll try it. Uh, so those, those things all happened at once. And the, the final thing that came in a little bit later, and if you've read the book, you know that one of the things I do is I'm actually using um, quotes from history books that I take verbatim. We used to call this plagiarization, but now it's not... <laughs> Now we call it curating. <laughs> but, but the reason for this was very simple. I had, this, I had the thing going with all these ghosts cross-talking, and I was having so much fun. So much masturbatory fun, actually, because when you write a, <laughs> when you write a ghost, they can do anything. The ghost did a backflip. The ghost's head flew off and turned into a pumpkin. Whatever you want. It's all fair game. Uh, so in that way, a ghost is a bit like a dream sequence. Totally up to you, Miss Writer. Uh, and I had a teacher, Tobias Wolf, who told me once, uh, he said, George, um, in your writing career, you're allowed three dream sequences, so don't use them up. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> so about halfway through this book, it was, I, I could feel that my imaginary reader was starting to look askance at me. There's too much ghost, too many ghosts, too much sort of free energy. And I also thought back to that first day when I saw Willie Lincoln's Crypt, and I thought, why did that move me so much? Part of it was because I did, after that incident, do some research, and you find out such heartbreaking things about that situation. For example, Willie was Abe's favorite. He was his favorite because he was the most like him. He had the same, you know, beauties and the same problems. Uh, also, the Lincolns uh, had a party scheduled at the White House. The party was set up to reduce costs. It was all in place. The invitations were out. 
the two boys got sick with what we now know as typhoid, but they just had high fevers. Uh, they consulted a doctor. The doctor said, I think it'll be fine. So they had the party, and it was that night that Willie took a turn for the worst, and he died weeks later. So the Lincolns definitely had the feeling that this party had, you know, all the excitement and the noise, the Marine band playing downstairs had hastened their son's death. How do you, how do you live with that? So when I asked myself, how do you know all that stuff, and in what form do you know it, I just knew it from five or six history books. So sitting there in my writing room, I thought, wow, hmm, could I just put that stuff in there directly? And I answered myself, it's your book. You <laughs> so I went to this period of cutting up the, uh, you know, typing up all those texts. Uh, Elizabeth Keckley, uh, um, there's another one, I forgot the names by now, but um, t t typing them up and then cutting them up with scissors and spending days on the floor of my study moving them around like a, like a puzzle, you know. And I started to think, one, I'm just doing this to avoid real writing, which I kind of was. Uh, also, it did seem a little bit, you know, invalid in some way. And then one day I had a certain arrangement uh, of that party scene, and I took this out, put that in, put it in, and suddenly when I read it, it came alive for me. It, it would have been sort of 1.7 dimensions, and it suddenly became three-dimensional in my mind. And I thought, well, if that isn't writing, I don't know what is. In other words, my job is to, when you're reading that scene, to make that party seem real to you uh, so you don't quibble with it. So it enters into your mind as something that actually happened. Well, that happened to me that day, so I thought, okay, this is a, a, a valid thing to do. Now, not long after, the, when the book came out, one of the reviewers said, uh, like the book, but isn't that fake news? <laughs> because what I did after that was I also made some up. <laughs> Once I started putting in these historical bits, I felt it was okay if I just invented some. Uh, so, so the quarrel was, isn't this fake news? And I, I just would like to close with one very important idea, I think, in our time. Uh, our, the, the political age we're in right now is one in which so many fundamental values are getting kicked around. Uh, what's really being lost is subtlety and nuance in public rhetoric. We, we are constantly saying things that we know aren't true. I say we to be generous. Um, <laughs> but, but this is one of the reasons that art is so essential. And I would argue that part of the reason we got to this pass in our history is because we've been insufficiently reverent toward art. Why do I say this? When I uh, write a book about Lincoln, and I put in some true historical bits, and then I make some up, you and I are in a very intimate relationship at that point. You came into the tent labeled novel, and you said, make it happen by any means necessary. I know you're lying to me. I want you to lie to me. Just do it well. So I believe it's true. And what we're doing together is we're, disc we're discovering a more transcendent truth than we can get at by walking around the world every day. It's almost like I, I have a vision I'm working in, I'm revising. And in that mode, I stop being this dummy and start being, for a couple minutes a day, a better person. Funnier, smarter, more insightful, more empathetic. You, on the other end, reading, hopefully, are doing the same thing. You're, this beautiful being is rising out of the normal you, up, and, then, and I'm coming up, and if in the perfect world, we're like two fish that kind of come out and kiss, you know, <laughs> and, and go back to our life. So when I say, uh, you know, when I make up a, a, a bit in a story like this, it's a little bit like when you're a kid and, and someone says, I'm going to tell you a ghost story. And it happened in this very room. It didn't. <laughs> but if you believe it did, it's a better story. So in a sense, now this is quite different from being, for example, in the White House briefing room. <laughs> and a cat comes in and we say, look, a raccoon. <laughs> that's, not, that's not it. So let, let me pause there, and uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. I'd be happy to answer any. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, I, I've been traveling for this book for almost a year now, and one thing I notice is, is some Darwinian thing. The, the person who asks the first question in, is always turns out to have the highest sexual energy in the room. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> Yeah. I had a feeling about you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My question is, the book is unusual. Yes. As you said, you, you fudged a lot. Mm -hmm. And 
the question I have is how did you sell this to your agent, your editor, and the publisher? Yes. When it was so, like, I have this idea. Yeah, that's a good question. The truth is I didn't sell it until I had it. I mean, I, I, had, um, I had a contract, and I just worked on the first third for about two years before I showed anybody. So by that time, I, I kind of knew, you know, as I said earlier, part of your job as a writer is to know the obvious problems with what you're doing, you know. Uh, so, you know, for example, if, if, I'm, if I am going to decide to, that tonight when I interview Vice President Biden, which I'm doing, that I'm going to wear a tight pink silk shirt. <laughs> Let's say I decide that. <laughs> Well, okay, I feel strongly I should do that. All right, you're gonna wanna think about that and you're gonna wanna take precautions. So in my case, that would mean wearing two windbreakers over it, but, but, but in art, you, you, there's always a problem at the beginning. With this book, I knew it was gonna be a hard sell. So I, my responsibility as a writer is to make it so all the difficulties earn difficulty. In other words, the idea of just making difficulty because you can, I'm not interested in that. My thought was it's the book's main goal is emotional. So anything that's weird or hard about it, it has to serve the emotion of the book. And what I started to feel is if I could get that first third shaped just right, and I spent so many hours on it, then your reaction might be, and I think a lot of people have this, I don't get this. But I'm intrigued. I'm going to keep, oh, I still don't get it. <laughs> wait, no, wait, I'm getting it. And, and I think right around page 30, people kind of make a decision. It either works for them or they go review it on Amazon but the, but but that but that's that was the the game so then the idea is if you do something at the beginning good enough it'll pay off in the end so i wrote it for those two years i showed it to my wife which i show her everything first and we've been together 30 years and she knows me she knows my bs she knows my virtues and uh, usually if she doesn't like with that that mexico book she wasn't mincing her words uh, and she was absolutely right. So with this book, I showed it to her, and she wrote me a note that was so nice that I will never tell anybody in this world what it said. <laughs> but, but I went, all right then. She got it. And then I just went on. So I, and then I sent it to my editor, and he had a, also a positive reaction and was willing to sort of take the chance with me. So, yeah. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Saunders. Hi. I have a question about, um, I guess this is between the fact and the fiction, and it's like the theology or like the religious beliefs that, underpin it. Uh, I'd never heard of a bardo, you know, I know of Bridges Bar Bridget Bardo, but um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, <laughs> and the, the, the thing that shows up, the matter of the light bloom, um, uh, can you help me with those words, the light bloom phenomenon yes. thing that happens. <laughs> so uh, would you be able to tell us if, if all of that was fictional or if some of it was based in some kind of religious theology? Sure, yeah. Well, my wife and I are Buddhists, and I originally thought, and in, in <coughs> Tibetan, bardo just means transitional state. So we're, we're in one right now, the bardo between birth and death. And then the one that the book refers to is the one that starts from the moment of your death to whatever comes next. And in Buddhism, of course, they believe it's reincarnation. Uh, so I started with that, and for a long time I thought I will try to um, read and learn the Tibetan Book of the Dead and make everything match. But then, <clears throat> you know, at some point uh, you realize that it's a novel, and the novel has things that it does. Uh, it makes beauty, it makes truth, it makes propulsion, it changes your mind, all those beautiful things. It doesn't, it really isn't the very best instrument for recounting fact, actually. We have books for that, you know. So this is kind of like if you had this beautiful Ferrari and you're like, oh, a paperweight. You know, no, well, you could, you could. So I thought, at some point I thought, I'm not going to worry too much about being faithful to the uh, Tibetan text since I don't really, I'm not a, a scholar in that area. So I'm going to use what I, what I want to use. And what I loved about, the, what I love about the Buddhist epistemology is a couple things. One is, they say uh, that whatever your death is going to be like, it's just like right now. In other words, your mind is, our minds are in very strong, habituated places every instant of our life. We don't even notice it after a while. We're so used to it. But we have inclinations of mind. It's not going to be any different at the moment of your death. And if I'm understanding the text right, it's not going to be different after. With one exception, the texts say that your mind in your body is sort of like a, a wild horse. You know, our neurotic minds are so active and so crazy, and they make the world... Well, when we're alive, that's actually tamped down. 
relative to what happens after death. They say it's like that wild horse tied to a pole. You cut the rope. The, the wild horse goes crazy. So whatever tendencies we have now, uh, multiply it times 10 million. God help us, you know. Uh, so that was intriguing, you know, the idea that your habits of thought and worry and covet, covetousness wouldn't actually go away when you die, but they would be exaggerated. So, so the book is set in the place where people have such intense regrets or hesitations that they can't actually go on to the next thing, and they, they stay there. So that was really about, about all that I, you know, took literally. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, thanks for um, coming. And I Thank you. I have to modify sort of my question because I was going to ask about, like, the theme of ghosts in your stories, uh, Civil War Land and Bad Decline, and, um, and the novel, just sort of how the idea of a ghost evolved. But I'm going to sort of modify it. And it's funny you mentioned Infinite Jest because it's another sort of ghost story, I mm -hmm. guess, um, to an extent. But I guess where do you find influence in, um, in this theme? in the theme of ghosts, the supernatural. Sure. Where does that, for you as an author? Yeah, you know, Flannery O'Connor, who I, one of my favorite writers, she said, uh, a writer can choose what he writes, but he can't choose what he makes live. So I, I teach at Syracuse, and we have great, we get something like 600 applications a year, and we pick six people to come study there. So these are world-class writers. And that O'Connor quote is so important, because most writers start off with a a love, of course, for other books, a love for other writers. We tend to imagine ourselves in a lineage of writers, and we start out by imitating. That's one of the first things we do. Uh, but we soon find out that there, the thing we want to do might not be the thing we should do. So like if you thought, I'm going to write string quartets a la Shostakovich, and whenever you wrote one, everybody fell asleep. But whenever you picked up an accordion, and people danced. Like, ah, you know? So. So, so for some reason, I don't really know, I like ghosts. They, ghosts make my books come alive. I can justify it. Uh, it you know, reminds me that this reality we're in right now is not the only one. I kind of like that idea. Uh, but really, I just do it because I, I love it. And I think with all of us, we start out with an intention if we want to be, and we start out imitating somebody. For me, it was Hemingway. I had this medical affliction uh, called a Hemingway boner, actually, which is... <laughs> Many writers get this. It's a real, it's a almost. So for many years, you know, I had, well, Hemingway is up on this mountain, and I just want to go be his acolyte. I want to stand up on his level. So I clawed my way up there over many years, working class kid, writing in Hemingway voice, you know. Nick went into the Walmart. <laughs> it, it was pleasant, you know. So you, you claw your way up there, and then you, when you get close, you find out that that guy is standing on about a, a six-inch pedestal. You are never going to get up as high as Hemingway. You're always going to be at his armpit, you know. So, oh, forget him. Why, why am I imitating that guy? I'm a working class person. I'll never imitate anybody again. You trudge down the hill and you get to the bottom and you go, oh, Kerouac Mountain. You know, <laughs> there's a working class guy and you, you do that. So for me, this was the whole process. And after many, many years, including that Mexican novel, uh, I just was so sick of it. And I realized that I knew some things at that point in my life and I didn't have a form or style in which I could express those very small, very precious things, uh, many of which had to do with class. So I wrote this little story, a crazy little story that was in my first book, and it was, felt so much like me, and it was so minor. I was so disappointed. It was a very bittersweet thing. It was like you look over, and there's a little shit hill, and it says, Saunders Mountain. And, and, you know, <laughs> Saunders is misspelled. You know, oh, there, there, there. But I think that's, that in a nutshell, that's every writer's journey, is you go from imitating great writers to being the little clod that you are and hoping that the shithill will grow over the years. I, I can take one more and then I have to say goodbye. Yeah. Um, hello. Hi. Um, I am a tired, sad, and exhausted MFA student who is worried my degree is about to be derailed by this tax bill. So I was wondering what advice do you have for young writers and scholars in light of the current political moment? Do it more and do it better. I, I have that advice for everybody. You know, the, the enemy right now is that despair that we felt a year ago. Oh, I'm quitting. This world sucks. It's not what I thought it was. I think the novelistic standpoint is, huh, the world isn't what I thought it was. How interesting. Let's figure this out, you know. I think we also have to remember that every, that the, that the fabric of the country is being held together by the tens of thousands of decent acts that we all commit every day. That's the real culture. The real culture doesn't come from on high, and we're finding out it never did, actually. It comes from each of us. And uh, so I think it's an it's a exciting time to be an artist, uh, and I think the, I, I tell myself every day two things. One, 
I don't know what's going on. You know, we play, you, you watch TV and everybody knows what's going on and every day it's different, you know. I think it's actually very healthy, spiritually healthy to say we don't know. This is something new. And the second thing is to say, uh, I forgot what it was already. That's so interesting. You know, what, what was that second thing? Darn it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, no, the second, the second thing is that despair actually is the enemy. I, I, I'm convinced that our country is on the brink of a beautiful breakthrough. Uh, you know, our vision of ourselves, that we're going to actually live into our creed, all people created equally, all people containing God or Buddha or whoever equally, we're going to see each other that way, we're going to treat ourselves better. We were almost there. I really think we were close to it. This is kind of a last-minute spasm, but we'll endure it and... Whatever we do in our lives, if we do it the best we can with a smile on our face, we'll get through this crap a lot faster. So thank you very much. Thank you, George Saunders. Thank you very much. And Mr. Saunders will be autographing his book across from the elevators on this floor. Thank you very much.